Hello! The existence of adversarial examples is a curse for AI safety. Imagine you have a neural network-based person recognizer and it works well most of the time, but not for a person with this printed t-shirt. Adversarial examples are examples of data that look very much to humans like normal data points, but neural networks think is something entirely different. For example, look at this panda. It is a panda, right? <laughs> this is also what a convolutional neural network would say. Then look at this panda. Ah, the neural network says it's a gibbon. And the difference between these pictures is not even perceivable to humans, it is this noise added to the original image, which here for visualization purposes has been enhanced a lot, but it's really just tiny. So how can it be that these very similar images differing by only tiny pixel differences are so differently perceived by neural networks? Well, there are some hypotheses for that, and I had the pleasure to talk about this with David Stutz, an AI safety and robustness researcher at Google DeepMind. We were at the 10th Heidelberg Laureate Forum a few weeks ago on a boat on the Neckar River. Here's my discussion with him. So, hello, I'm here at the 10th HLF with David Stutz. He's a very interesting researcher and person, and I wanted to talk to him. So see what he has to say. In an offline conversation, you told me that you were doing research on adversarial defenses. And uh, you told me that it's harder to publish research on adversarial defenses than on attacks, which I find counterintuitive. So could you please explain me why this is counterintuitive and how this is the case? Um, so it's a combination of things. So first of all, um, the mathematical property is that it's always easier to find a counterexample than to find a proof, right? So in mathematics, if I have a proof, I have a published paper, and I find a counterexample, that's very easy, right? Of course, usually uh, common sense tells us I don't just publish a counterexample, I contact people and kind of usually counterexamples lead to kind of improved proof so you can learn something from it. But it's much easier to find a single counterexample than to prove a statement in its generality. Um, and I think that very much holds in security as well. It's always easier to find a vulnerability because you only need to find one, right? Then to have a system and then like in, in computer science, of course, or in machine learning, we empirically evaluate it. But in, in security and cryptography, you usually want to prove that the system is secure. And that's, of course, much harder. So what happened in, in adversarial machine learning and robustness against adversarial examples is that finding attacks, I'm not, I'm not saying it's trivial. Um, but once you understand kind of the, the, the tools that are used, the optimization tools and so on, it's usually fairly straightforward to find corner cases and to build attacks that kind of are stronger or that kind of are less visible or whatever you're interested in. The other way around, however, is much harder because you basically, you need to train a model where you can't find adversarial examples. And, and even in practice, that's a bit ill-defined because you're, like you have a method to find that result examples. But this is of course also an approximation, right? You can't, like you have a machine learning model with like millions of parameters. It's not that you can find all possible adversarial examples. You only need to find one. But at, during training, if you want to train robust models, you of course, you need to be robust to like all possible adversarial examples. It's a much, much harder task. And then on the, on, the, on the academic side, because it was a very new field, it just also happened that people didn't really know yet how to properly review papers on the matter. Um, so security folks, for example, were very new to this idea of empirically evaluating accuracy. The, the machine learning folks were very new to this idea of, of security, of like having this adversarial notion. And so it just happened that in the early days, uh, it, was, it was, and it's of course a subjective opinion, uh, a bit easier to find loopholes and find problems with models rather than present a method that actually that is robust against a wide range of attacks and a wide range of problems and so I always find it found it a bit more challenging to work on the defense side but on the other hand if you like the, the, the reward is also a bit higher right I mean if you find a really good defense so back then the Marty lab found adversarial training or even even some papers uh, before them were doing similar things but it's very long-standing, right? It's still the state of the art. Whereas attacks evolved much quicker. People iterated on attacks much quicker. So it's, um, it's higher risk and maybe higher reward, however you'll say it. 
Yeah, this is a nice piece of history because, yeah, something which is hard, defenses, should be, I think, more appreciated by the community than also rewarded uh, in conferences. Yeah. Uh, we heard here at the HLF a lecture by Adi Shamir on adversarial attacks and he presented his dimpled manifold hypothesis. I'm cl claiming that this is actually going to be the decision boundary, namely it is going to be roughly the same as the very close to the image manifold with a small dimple underneath the cats so that the cats will be above and it will have a dimple above all the guacamoles so that the guacamoles will be on the bottom part. Everything at the bottom is going to be called by the network guacamole. Everything at the top half is going to be called the cat. What do you think of this hypothesis and are, you, are there any alternative hypotheses for adversarial examples? Um, yeah, there are quite a few hypotheses and a fun fact is that I actually, so my first two, two papers of my PhD are more or less exactly on the same question, so why do adversarial examples exist and can we kind of find an intuitive explanation. Um, and so yeah, I, I found the talk very nice, um, mainly because, I mean, he didn't need to convince me because I was already convinced by the manifold theory. I think it's a very intuitive explanation, um, maybe not why adversarial examples exist, but it gives us basically a mental model of how to think about adversarial examples. And in the past years, a lot of works have built on top of this mental model and, and try to kind of use these insights to improve defenses, to make attacks more effective and so on. So I met, very much enjoyed the talk, also from the perspective that he's of course a very accomplished researcher, mainly coming from security, right? And I like that he uh, he kind of stood in, on top, like in front of like a lot of laureates, a lot of young researchers, and highlighted this as an important problem, um, which I think if we would have had that five years ago, uh, there would have been much more traction in, in adversarial machine learning. Uh, but I still appreciate it, because it also means that, that the disciplines are moving closer together. Because, they, they, I mean, people realized very early on that it's like adversarial machine learning or robustness topics, out of distribution detection and so on, are security problems. Nowadays, of course, people are working also on poisoning attacks, uh, watermarking and so on. Uh, but in, in the academic world, uh, conferences, journals and so on, also research groups, we are still very much separated. And so for us, for example, it was very difficult to, to, to publish in, in the security domain, a very different style of writing and so on. And I think it's a good sign that like very prominent researchers uh, kind of realize that this will be very important questions in the future. And also these are challenging topics that, that uh, even laureates can't like solve on the spot. And I, ho I really hope that, that it's moving closer together. I mean, there are already small conferences and workshops that that kind of are in the intersection, but I think it's it's great if prominent figures, uh, yeah, support this kind of movement. And do you think there are other notable hypotheses, or do you think the dimpled manifold hypothesis is uh, the one that explains most of the phenomena, and you're you're happiest with that? I mean, personally, I like the manifold hypothesis. I worked on it very much, so uh, it's very much a bias of, <laughs> of uh, from my side. Um, but I think part. So a hypothesis is always a model of what's going on. We still don't know exactly why adversarial examples exist. Also, in images, I think the, the manifold hypothesis is very natural because like this idea of images living in a low dimensional manifold of, of your high dimensional pixel space is very natural. But of course now if we, if we go to LLMs and we think about language, if we go to graphs and so on, the hypothesis might still be valid, but it might be less intuitive. And so for me, a hypothesis is always kind of tied into what, what can we use the hypothesis to learn something new? Can we apply the hypothesis to kind of develop new attacks, new defenses, whatever? Um, so there are alternative hypotheses. Um, I think um, before, there, there is kind of this notion of features that are kind of only slightly correlated with your, um, with your how to say, with your targets. And there's this notion that you have uh, useful features and you have features by chance, right? It just happens that specific pixels in this finite data set happen to correlate with your target, but it's not really, it's not really what you want to learn. Classic example is in vision, pe people work on, on these biases that you introduce. If you see birds always in front of water, you pick up on the water and not on the bird, right? So 
and you can you can have a similar notion of, of this happening and this being exploited by adversarial examples. So and this is just one example. So I think there are alternative hypotheses, and I think all of some of them are useful in different respects. And uh, for example, this hypothesis very much informed how today we think about proper generalization in computer vision. There are data sets that now test this problem, right? We have in the training set we have water birds on land and land birds on water and then at test time we strip it right we, we just you can see it as like an, an adversarial way of testing um and and for this line of work like these these alternative hypotheses were very inferential um i think in adversarial robustness i think the manifold hypothesis was still more inferential than others but this this very much depends on what people are working on and i think i always believe the more hypothesis the better and of course there are some hypotheses that you can find counter examples but in the end we have still a very poor understanding of, of like these very deep models. And I think with like these really huge foundational models, it's not getting better. So I think, um, I think there's a lot to explore, both from the practical and the theoretical side. Okay, thanks a lot. I conducted this interview at the 10th HLF, which is short for Heidelberg Laureate Forum. The HLF is an annual gathering of 200 young researchers from math and computer science and laureates of the most prestigious awards in these two fields, such as the Turing Award, the Fields Medal, the Abel Prize and so on. I attended the last year's HLF as a young researcher and this year as a press member. The best things for me at the HLF remain the lengthy coffee breaks and social events at incredible occasions such as the Speyer Museum of Technology or the boat on the Neckar River on which we were on the interview which you've just seen on this video. And I hope you have found this discussion with David Stutz about adversarial attacks and defenses as interesting as Miss Coffee Bean did. We both hope to see you next time. So subscribe subscribe okay bye last question <laughs> will you attend the HLF again do you plan to uh, well I mean the main question is not will I or, or do I want to um, but can I or am I allowed to um, so this year so I was last time here in 2019 as a PhD student and obviously I could come back officially as a postdoc mm -hmm. yeah so I definitely uh, I, I, I think it's still not well known the HLF especially international but all people I meet during my PhD, during my postdoc, I always say, as long as you can apply, right? I mean, there's no guarantee that that you can that you're taken and that you have have the privilege to come. But I mean, there's no it doesn't hurt to apply, and you can apply every year as long as you qualify. As I think, a couple of years after your PhD, so yeah, please apply. Thanks a lot. This was a really cool motivational speech, and I hope <laughs> this will bear fruit. So yeah, thanks again for talking to me, and yeah. uh, have a great HLF. Yeah, thank you.